My name is Jeremy Green. Uh, I'm from Fort Collins, Colorado. I uh, flew out here on Friday. Um, second time in Boston. It's been like 10 years, so it's kind of cool to walk around and see the area. Um, I own a web design company called Indo Creative. Uh, build custom themes and plugins for clients. And I also have a side project uh, called Zine 101, where we build a kind of a publishing platform for uh, kind of magazines, uh, newspapers, stuff like that uh, on WordPress. So today I'm going to talk to you about the final 20% improving craftsmanship in web development. So this guy, his name is Soren Markinson. He's the owner of a coffee shop in Denmark called Great Coffee. Sounds like a good name for a coffee shop, if you ask me. Um, his passion is making the best cup of coffee possible. He flies to coffee farms in Central America to taste coffee beans at the source, and he experiments with different methods and ratios to find the best coffee flavor from each kind of bean. And he sees himself as a coffee craftsman. Now, myself, I and, uh, call myself an amateur coffee craftsman. I have a French press. I grind up my coffee every morning, try out different beans from different places. I love going to new coffee shops and new places. When I came here, the first thing I did, um, I did the Airbnb thing for the first time. So I got a, a place in someone's house. And the first thing I did when I got in was Yelp, where's the best coffee shop that's closest to where I am? Just so I could test out their beans and stuff. Um, but the cool thing with this is that his whole goal is to be a craftsman in what he does. Some people, Folgers is good enough. That's all they need. They just need something hot. But his uh, goal is to pr produce the best kind of coffee he can. Um, some people call him crazy. Some people don't think it's worth it. But to him, it's worth it. So a craftsman is someone who creates with skill. They practice and refine their trade, the skills in their trade continuously. They never finish practicing because improvement is a constant, constant journey. It's never the destination. So today I'm going to talk to you about how to incorporate craftsmanship in web development. I'm going to talk to you about the things that I've learned in refining my skills over the past five years of building custom themes and plugins and running a business. So I started out knowing very little in the beginning. Um, I've experimented with many different tools, many different processes when it comes to building websites and running a business. And I've made lots of mistakes, uh, but thankfully mistakes are how you improve. So there's a book called The Talent Code uh, by Daniel Coyle where he talks, talks about the concept of deep practice. Has anyone ever read that book before? So there's really cool uh, kind of branch of science that's coming out uh, where they're studying something called myelin. And what they've discovered is that myelin is this thing that wraps around neurons and basically it insulates the neurons. And the more myelin that you develop, the better that neuron can fire. And so the way to develop that myelin is to practice something over and over and over again. And the slower you practice, the more deliberate you practice, the more and better the myelin wraps. So this technique of deep practice takes those mistakes and turns them into skills. So every time you fire that circuit and you make a mistake and you get just that tiny bit better, you get another layer of that myelin that wraps around that neuron. And that deep practice, doing it over and over and over again, is how you improve your skills. So in order to engage with deep practice, the process looks like this. So first you try something that's slightly beyond your comfort zone. Then you slowly struggle through learning that new technique. So for me in coding, a lot of times that's, you know, I, I get a client and they say, hey, I need this done. And so i like, yes, I can do it because that's what I do. So I then go into you know, my code editor or whatever, go to Google and like, all right, now I've got to figure out how to solve this problem. And then I find a solution that might get me halfway there, or maybe there is no solution, and I have to creatively come up with something. So you struggle slowly and slowly and slowly until you figure out how to reach that solution. 
And the cool part is the next time a client comes and they need that same thing done, you've already struggled through it, you've already developed that myelin, and you can accomplish it without having to go through that same process again. And so the more you do this with a different set of skills, the more and more of a craftsman you become. So another example is switching to SaaS. So has anyone used SaaS in their development process? All right, so I switched to SaaS probably like uh, two and a half years ago, something like that. And before that, just using straight CSS. And you know, I'd heard about SaaS before, but I was kind of, you know, oh, it looks cool, but I'm busy building websites. I don't have time to learn something new. Um, but eventually I was like, you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use SaaS in this project. And so the first thing I did was I decided I'm gonna use SaaS in my next WordPress project that comes along. And I'm just gonna use one new feature. So I chose nesting. So that's all I did is I learned how to nest. And the next project came along and I added another layer of complexity. Okay, I'm gonna play around with mix-ins now. And the next project, the next project, so on and so forth. And so you break it up into chunks and then by you know, four or five projects in, uh, you've increased your skills to that next level. So, um, so as a result of using that deep practice technique, um, I've been able to greatly improve my efficiency. So efficiency is a vital part of becoming a great craftsman. Efficiency in the predictable parts of a project will give you more time and energy to practice your skills on the difficult and challenging parts. In 1897, there was a guy named Vilfredo Pareto, and he was a, a, an economist in Italy. He investigated patterns of wealth and income in the 19th century, and he found that there was a consistent mathematical relationship between the proportion of people and the amount of wealth that this group had. So basically, he found that 20% of the people had 80% of the wealth. But not only did he find this uh, in his study, but he also found that across time periods and across location, this same ratio applied. Interestingly enough, he also found that if he looked in his garden, that 20% of his pea pods produce 80% of his peas. So what he, what they, what he discovered is this ratio is kind of like a uh, across the board ratio. It applies not just to economics, but to things all across different industries and spaces. So later, there was a Harvard professor named George Zipp who discovered the principle of least effort. And what he found is that 20% of the work usually completes 80% of the project. He found that resources like time and skills tended to arrange themselves to, so as to minimize work. So this meant that any resource, whether it be time or skill or whatever it is that you do in your day to day, that only 20% of it is going to account for 80% of the results. So what's the other part of that? That 80% of the work you do is largely irrelevant, but we'll get into that later. So in 1963, IBM discovered that about 80% of a computer's time is spent computing only 20% of the operating code. So what they did is they told their engineers to rewrite the operating software to make the most used 20% very accessible and user friendly. So let's take a look at how the 80-20 principle can be used to improve your efficiency and productivity. Because everyone wants to be more efficient, right? You want to be more productive in what you do in a day-to-day -day basis. So, statistically speaking, like I said, 80% of what you achieve in your job comes from only 20% of the time you spend doing it. That means that four-fifths of the effort you put into your last project was largely irrelevant. I'm not saying it was pointless, but it was largely irrelevant. So, the thing that you need to ask yourself is why continue to spend 80% of your effort on the 20% of the project that is largely irrelevant. So how do you transfer your weak resources to be strong resources? So let's take a look at that. So the trick is to use the 80-20 principle that we've talked about to multiply your effort to, take low pro to make your low productivity skills nearly as productive as your high productivity skills. 
You have to find ways to make your unproductive and unproductive resources more effective. So as you do this with each area of a project, like I talked about adding SAS earlier, the few things that work fantastically well should be identified and then multiplied. And whatever you experiment with and proves to be of low value, just abandon those things. You tried it, it didn't work, get rid of it. So let's take a look at a few examples of how I've used this on my own. So when I first started my business, um, I didn't, I had no um, training as far as anything goes. I was, uh, if you were in the musician's talk earlier, I actually went to school uh, to be a, uh, for music technology, so that's what I got my degree in. Um, did that for a few years out of college, um, then couldn't find a job and decided, you know what, I know how to build websites, so I'll start building websites. So that's what I did. So set up shop, um, no formal training at all, and I had to figure all this stuff out on my own. So for project management, starting out, my clients, uh, the first thing I did is just create folders on a desktop, and that was good enough. So I'd get a new, new client, I'd put the files for the project inside of there, and I was good to go. And that was fine until I got you know, more than three clients. Um, but as, so as I got more projects and clients, um, keeping tabs of everything that was going on became nearly impossible. Uh, figuring out what was due when, where was this file at, how in the world um, am I gonna get all this done because I had no schedule. Um, like I said, I was figuring this all out. I was making mistakes, I was learning what worked, and I was learning what didn't work. So I was spending a large, of large amount of time managing a project, but the time that I was spending was very inefficient. So then I found Trello. Does anyone use Trello? Okay. So it was cool and it was free. And as a bootstrap business, I liked free. Free was good. So I moved all my projects into Trello and immediately felt more organized. Every project had its own board, I created lists and cards for different parts of the project so I wouldn't lose track of things. Um, I could invite other people to collaborate on a project. So if I had another developer or designer, I could bring them on with me. Um, so I had just taken my project management skills and efficiency from here to here. So I was making my weak resource just that little bit stronger. However, my business continued to grow. And as new projects came in, I continued to add them to Trello, thinking, oh, this is great. But the more I used it, the more I noticed, oh, you know, it's good, but there's still some inefficiencies here. So email notifications weren't consistent. It was hard to remember what card had what discussion thread. Um, and over time, the dashboard became so cluttered, it was hard to keep track of everything and keep it all organized because there was just so much data. Um, so it was time to experiment and find a better solution. And I needed, once again, to improve my efficiency. So that's when I moved to Basecamp. So I had some other company as I was working for, and they'd use Basecamp, and so I was like, you know what, I'll give this a shot. So I signed up for the free trial, created an account, and my next project that I had, I threw it into Basecamp. Um, and I really liked using it. So I could see everything associated with the project really easily, the way that it maps everything. I could create to-do lists to see exactly what needed to be done. I could invite um, other developers, other designers. I could invite clients but keep stuff private. I could assign things to different people, set events. Um, all these things helped to improve my efficiency. Um, once again, I'd taken my efficiency from here to here. I was getting the exact same end product, but the time it took to complete that end product was a lot shorter. Um, so another example is uh, site development. So as web developers, we're always looking for ways to improve our process. That's why we come to things like WordCamps. We want to learn what are other people doing and how can we use the tools that other people are using to improve our workflow and our own processes. Um, so for site development, the first thing when I started out was I learned how to work locally. I didn't know how to work locally, so I was like, you know what? It's important to be able to do this, so I sat down and figured out how to work locally. And then once you get to that point, then you start figuring out, oh, I need a staging server. I shouldn't be pushing files up to the live site, right? So you figure out how to set up a staging server. And then you figure out how to get onto version control. And then you figure out how to get on deployment. 
The point is that you don't have to do all those things at once if you're just starting out. Tr find something that is just a little bit beyond where you're currently at, wherever your comfort zone might be. Find something that's just a little bit beyond that and struggle through the process until you get to the point where you've got that. And then you're at this level. And then find something else to continue to struggle and improve and improve. Okay? So I was, again, I was producing the exact same end product, but I was doing it faster. So let me just make clear that I'm not advocating speed and efficiency at the cost of quality. So your quality of work should actually improve as you become more efficient. So the reason for this is because you have more time to focus on code quality when you're not worrying about all the little tiddly things that you um, shouldn't have to be worrying about. Okay? Um, the, more t um, the more time you have to problem solve, the more time you have to learn new techniques. So as a craftsman, quality of work should be one of your highest priorities. And I already talked about that slide, so we'll just keep moving on. All right. So automation is a great way to improve efficiency. We've talked a lot about automation uh, at this conference if you're using something like Grunt uh, or Gulp or something like that uh, for task running. Uh, but you can also apply it to a lot of other stuff just in project management in general. Um, so look through your manual tasks and menial tasks that you do every day and figure out how they can be automated. Um, use tools like SAS and Compass can really increase your um, workflow when it comes to building sites with CSS. Uh, there's tools like uh, If This Then That or Zapier or Slack that you can set up to create automatic workflows between different services. So we have an integration um, at our at company Zine 101 where if we have a support request that comes in into Help Scout, instead of me having to check my email every time, I just have Slack open and it sends me a notification all in Slack. We also get noticed whenever there's sales that come in and all those kind of things. So you can set up these integrations to where you're accomplishing the same thing, but you're doing it in a lot more efficient manner. So just look at all the different processes that you go through in a day-to-day -day, uh, workflow and figure out, is there something that can be automated here so I don't have to keep clicking that button or going to that website? Or can I get all the data into one place so I don't have to figure out where or try and remember where it is that that one piece of data is that I need? Again, automation of menial tasks lets you focus on building, creating, and improving your skills. So how do you automate? You build systems. Systems help you bring order and chaos to a product, to, to a project, but systems also help you scale. So in March, I hired my first employee. Um, I, like I said, I've been doing this for almost five years now. And it got to the point where I couldn't do it all anymore. Like, I just had too much work coming in. Um, so I had two options. I could basically say, no more work. Send it to other people I know. People would call me. I'd be like, nope, I can't take it. Or I could be like, you know what? I'm going to learn how to manage a business uh, and manage another employee. So that's what I did. So I decided to hire someone on. Um, but the problem with that is that everything I've done for the past five years has all been in my head because it was just me doing it. So I had to figure out a way to get what was in my head out of my head and into his head. Not in a weird way, but you know what I'm saying. So um, he didn't know, uh, his name's Tim, he didn't know how I wanted things done unless I got out of, everything out of my head and onto a, what I call a procedures document. Does anyone work somewhere and they have a procedures document or something like that, or know what I'm talking about. Okay. Does anyone um, not have that and you just kind of make it up as you go along? It's okay. That's where I was three months ago. So, um, so a pre procedures document is just a fancy word for checklist. So I keep it as simple as possible. So what I did is I created a text file in Sublime. It can be a text file, notepad, whatever you want. And I put it in the Dropbox folder that's synced between me and Tim. And as things come up that I need to write down the projects or write down the steps for, I would open up that text document and literally one, blah, 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 two. Has, has anyone in like elementary school or middle school 
they have got the assignment of like you have to tell someone how to make a peanut butter sandwich but they have to like do exactly what you say and they're like you should open the jar and you're like well how do i open the jar and you have to keep drilling down and down and literally like put your left hand on the bottle and your right hand on the lid so that's kind of what a procedures document is because like i said it was all in my head i understood how to do it but he didn't understand how to do it so for every little step that goes into a procedure, write it down. So what I did is, for example, when I started a new theme build, I went through my normal process, which I knew how to do because I'd done it for five years, and then I stopped after each single step and wrote down what I'd done in that procedures document. So this is called documenting as is. So after you're done, look through that written process and see if you can find any inefficiencies. Or if you're in the middle of a project and you find a tool or trick or tip that could improve that process, stop immediately what you're doing, go back to your procedures document and update it. So every time you need to repeat a certain task, you can go straight to that procedures document and follow those steps. So get it all down on paper. So having a procedures document for your business, it eliminates guessing, it sets guidelines for what is expected, and it greatly improves consistency between your projects. It also removes the burden of having to remember everything in your brain, um, which gives you brain space to focus on the challenging parts of your project. Because you don't want to have to remember, okay, how do I you know, create this project inside of Basecamp and assign this to this client and do all these things when you really need to be focusing on how do I build a migration tool that's going to get me from Drupal to WordPress. You know, those are the things you need to be spending your mind thinking about, not the little menial tasks. So again, here's a nice little checklist for how to write a procedure. Number one, do the task as you normally would. Number two, for each step you complete, describe it in detail in a one, two, three step checklist. Number three, evaluate each step to see if it can be simplified or improved. Number four is experiment with different techniques. All right, so this kind of goes back to the project management piece. Just because you have a procedure doesn't mean you can't experiment with different techniques and improve it. And then finally, if you do find an improvement, update the original working procedure. So the final 20%, is the name of my talk, what does that mean? So up to this point, we discussed ways to improve the 80% of a project that is predictable. But as you all know, there's still the 20% of a project that never goes according to plan. The client requests a new feature a week before launch. Every time you squash a bug in code, three more pop up. Um, you promise the client you can build it, and now you have to go figure out how to build it. So every project has different layers of complexity. Easy, simple, and complicated. It's the complicated parts that require the most brain power. So by removing the amount of brain power needed for that 80% of a project that is simple, you can al allocate even more of the 20% to the part of the project that is complicated. So the complicated part will usually take the most time, even though it's the smallest part of the project. So one of the reasons it's uh, the longest piece is because there is no clear solution at the beginning. So without a clear solution, the best way to move forward is by experimenting. So experimenting, really basic, but sometimes it's good to get reminded. Number one, try something. Number two, see if it works. Number three, repeat. It's OK to experiment. So sometimes you need to be reminded of this because whenever you're running a business, you just need to get stuff done sometimes. You have client work coming in, and you just need to get stuff done. So you have to be able to make space in your day to learn new techniques, to be able to experiment. Um, I was uh, at WordCamp Denver uh, a few weeks back, and Chris Lemma did a talk. And he, he gave a slide, and I thought it was really cool. And it was like, if you need margin to experiment, charge more. So if you don't have time, <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure if everybody got this. Let me just make sure. Make, if you don't have time to experiment, charge more. So you make more money and you have less clients. Does that make sense? Think about it, you should do it. Final 20% to the easy 
The next time a similar challenge or problem arises, you have already developed the skills necessary to accomplish it. it the problem that was in that 80% or that was in that 20% is now in the 80%. So the next time you come to a project, the part that was complicated is now simple. So the goal is project by project to take to every time to figure out something that is complicated and move it to the simple column. So the next project that comes up, you take another thing that's complicated and move it to the simple column. So get some low hanging fruit. So think right now where in your current workflow would an efficiency improvement make the most impact. So think for just a minute and let me know some. Where do you think in your current workflow could you be more efficient? Faster laptop. Faster laptop. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Moving files around. Anyone else? Let's get one more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So client intake. So getting out of that's a bit, that's a good one for procedure. If you have a something written down where you follow it every single time and you don't have to think about all right, what was that next step? Or you know, something like that, getting that written down really helps. So here's a few ideas to get you started. I just kind of did a brain dump and here's some that I came up with. Um, so keeping all your notes and to do's for a project in one place. I found that that really, really helps me out because I don't have to, you know, I have a meeting with a client and I don't have to go back a week later and remember where, would it, where was it that I put that to-do list? Where was it that I put those notes? Having one place where they always go is very important. Use code snippets. So if you're not using code snippets, uh, definitely do that, whether it's through like Sublime Text snippets. Um, Alfred has a nice little snippet uh, thing that you can use. That's what I use for most of my stuff. Um, but learn how to use code snippets so you don't have to rewrite the same kind of code over and over and over again. Uh, develop locally. If you're not doing that yet, definitely do that. It'll speed up your process. Using a starter theme or a framework, um, something like underscores or bones or something to that effect. So you don't have to write the basic HTML structure over and over and over. Um, speed up your computer. Uh, that can be a big one. I mean, it's something that you're using all day, every day. And if you're, <laughs> yeah. So it's something you're using all the time. And so speeding up just the machine you're working on will just, in effect, make you faster. Um, learn how to use your tools better. Uh, if, you, if you were like, you know what, I'm good. I, I'm as efficient as I can be. Um, just learn how to use a tool that you use every day. Just read the documentation on it and find out a new little feature or something it has that you didn't know about. Um, create projects templates with checklists. Uh, learn keyboard shortcuts. Uh, if you can wean yourself from the mouse and not use a mouse ever again, you'll make yourself a whole lot faster. So I'll just throw that out there. And then again, you know, start using a CSS preprocessor if you're not doing that. There's lots more. These are just some I just uh, threw out. So some of the books I would recommend if this sounds like something that you need to do in your own business um, is The Talent Code. Uh, Work the System is a great book on how to build systems into your business. Um, and if you give them their email address, they'll actually give you the entire PDF for free. Um, if you just Google work the system book, you'll find it. 80-20 um, principle is a good book. Um, the ultimate sales machine, I know it sounds kind of cheesy, but it actually talks a lot about processes and systems and how to develop those, not only in a single person business, but also in agencies and smaller uh, or larger companies. So if you're in a larger company and you don't have procedures or they need to be improved, this would be, that'd be a good book to check out. Um, also, the four hour work week, um, Tim Ferriss talks a lot about 80 20 principle and applying that to your life. Um, so, that's another one, a uh, good one to check out. So, I'm going to leave you with this story. Toyota, 30 years ago, was a middle sized car company. Nothing big, nothing to shout about. 
but now it's the world's lar largest automaker. Most analysts attribute Toyota's success to its strategy of Kaizen, which is Japanese for continuous improvement. Kaizen is the process of finding and improving small problems. So each employee from the janitor on up has the authority to stop the production line at any time if they see a problem. The vast majority of improvements come from employees and the vast majority of the changes are very small. So like a one foot shift in the location of a parts bin. Nothing big, just a one foot shift. But they add up. And it's estimated that each year Toyota implements around a thousand of these tiny fixes in its assembly lines about, with about a million tiny fixes overall since they've started. So anytime you're working on a project in your day to day and something goes wrong, ask yourself why five times. In one of their plants they have this over the, uh, the door as you walk into the plant. When something goes wrong, ask why five times. So I encourage you in your own projects, in your own workflows, in your own business, when something goes wrong, ask why and figure out how you can improve that process. And whenever you figure out how to improve that process, document it so you'll remember it for next time. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. For proposals? Yeah, so there's a few out there um, as far as like um, bid sketch is one of them. Um, personally, what I did is I have a uh, pages document, Word document, whatever, and then I just uh, use that as a template. And then depending on a per project basis, I just change out the information. Um, so that's what I use and it works great. So also in FreshBooks you can create proposals, kind of like they're not very detailed, but you can create proposals and send those and turn them straight into invoices from that. So, yeah. Yeah. I just know that there's a WordPress thing called WP Biz that lets you make proposals in WordPress and send them to your clients online. Yep. There's also a, a Sprout apps. It's a WordPress plugin suite, and I think they might have a proposal piece as well. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm Space Camp, and I'm wondering if you have any automated tips for that, because I get why somebody assigns something to me. So many what? Sorry? If somebody assigns something to me, or there's a discussion, I get an email, sort of delete all emails, and then go in sometimes a day. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So what's what's the pr what's the problem? So if you weren't getting the emails, would that make it easier? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the the only thing I've seen with that that I've played around with is that you can set it up to where it only emails you every few hours. Okay. So even if you have like 30 email notifications, it'll only send an email like once every four hours or something like that. So if you just want to clean up your inbox, yeah. that's a good way to do that. Right. So, yep. Any other questions or comments? Cool. All right. Well, thanks.